Okay, welcome everybody for the last, thanks God, <laughs> seminar of this semester. I'm so happy that this semester is finishing. And today we are finishing with um, Dr. Shamila Bhattacharya. Sorry for my misspelling, Shamila. From India. Um, Shamila done his her graduation in geology in 2007 and a master in applied geology in 2009 from Presidency College, University of Calcutta in Calcutta, in India. Her doctoral dissertation deals with organic geochemistry, focusing on hydrocarbon biomarkers, in crude oils and sediments. And she was conducted in consultation with Professor Suriendu Dutta in the Department of Earth Sciences in IIT Mumbai, Mumbai in 2015. Besides, he has been associated with the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences in Aysa Mohali as an inspired faculty from November 2017 to November 2022. <clears throat> and as a third research scientist since September 2023, still present. The nature of her work at Aysa Mohali includes teaching and research, and she deals with organic geochemistry and geobiology. And today she is going to talk us to talk about the impact of wildfires on the fate of Ruana Flora during the Permian Triassic transition, a lesson for the past and the future. So, Sharmila, thank you very much for virtually coming to the Middle East, and the podium is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Goldman, for the introduction and the opportunity uh, to present uh, my research. So, this in this talk, uh, I will present a recent research on uh, late Permian, uh, early Triassic, uh, upper Permian, uh, lower Triassic sediments from a Gondwana basin in Eastern India. And as we know that this time window, the late Permian, early Triassic time window, it qualifies uh, as a mass extinction boundary. In fact, the severest mass extinction that the earth has witnessed so far. So, so if we look uh, into the look back the entire history of uh, planet Earth, which spans for about 4.56 billion years. So this entire time window can be subdivided into smaller time windows, smaller time slices, uh, you know, the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, and the uh, uh, and the uh, the Phenerozoic. So <clears throat> the Phenerozoic uh, has this Phenerozoic eon has experienced big five uh, mass extinction events. So the end Ordovician, uh, the end Devonian, the end Permian, end Triassic, and end Cretaceous. And my uh, one of the current interests uh, in research. Uh, is uh, uh, the the mass extinction which uh, happened, which occurred uh, around 251 million years ago, and as I said, that this is the severest mass extinction that the Earth has witnessed, where about 90 percent of species, marine species, uh, went extinct, and about 70 percent of terrestrial vertebrates uh, were obliterated. So I'm an organic geochemist and I study biomarkers. So biomarkers are hydrocarbons, are organic compounds preserved in sediments. And if we have a look at the geological time scale, if we, if we have a look at the biomarkers across the geological time scale, we will see uh, that at uh, crucial uh, times across the time scale, uh, various, uh, you know, new types of compounds have evolved, which can be traced back to particular organisms. And these biomarkers have, uh, the study of biomarkers has a very wide range of applications. So it can be uh, used to, it can be studied to understand uh, various aspects of life on earth, early life, uh, you know, evolution of life, uh, extinction, and uh, phenomena like uh, the origin of uh, the origin of prokaryotes, origin of eukaryotes, the origin of multicellular life. Okay, and 
uh, biomarkers are also widely applied in the study of uh, fuel, uh, petroleum and coal formation, petroleum source rocks, uh, you know, source rock uh, and crude oil correlation, oil oil uh, correlation. Uh, so it can be also applied in the study of uh, fuel or fuel geology. Recently, biomarkers are also widely applied uh, in the field of archaeology and uh, in the study and understanding of environmental pollutants in recent, uh, in modern or uh, recent sediments. So what exactly are biomarkers? Uh, so if we look into the cellular membrane structure, uh, so, so this is uh, an illustration of a cellular membrane structure. So we see that uh, a cell membrane is, uh, the, the basic framework of a cell membrane is a lipid bilayer. So this is uh, one of the layers, this is the other layer. And we see uh, uh, proteins, we see carbohydrates, but the main framework is that of the lipid bilayer. And, uh, you know compounds that we see in between these uh, these chains, uh, which are called terpenoids. There are various types of terpenoids. It's a it's a huge uh, class of uh, compounds. Uh, th these terpenoids, and uh, the main framework of the lipid bilayer uh, that we see here. These are made up of uh, fatty acids. Fatty acids with uh, varying chain lengths. So this chain length uh, in the fatty acids, uh, they vary across different types of organisms. Microbes have a certain uh, a certain range of chain lengths, which are smaller. Uh, plants and animals, they have different uh, chain length ranges. Uh, so, so the main framework is that of fatty acids and of these, these terpenoids, which comprise uh, steroids and hoponoids. So uh, now uh, the biomarkers, uh, so, so which part of the cellular membrane structure is actually the biomarker? So what happens in the sediments is after the demise of the organisms, when the organisms die and, uh, you know, the, the, the wonderful uh, equilibrium of life uh, is lost. So these organisms, uh, the, the uh, you know, the physiology stops. And uh, so, so these organisms, they sink and, uh, you know, they start degrading. So uh, degrading as in these biopolymers that make up organisms, they start degrading. Now the proteins and the carbohydrates, they degrade much faster. Whereas the, uh, the, the lipid bilayer and the terpenoid compounds, they are recalcitrant. Their structures are such that uh, they do not break down very easily. They, they do degrade, but they degrade much slowly. But the proteins and carbohydrates are uh, very quickly, uh, they, they are completely degraded, they're completely oxidized. So these, but the lipids, that is the fat molecules, you know, so these fat molecules, uh, as they undergo burial and diagenesis, some uh, some minor alterations occur in the structure. So uh, if you consider this particular uh, compound, so this is uh, a type of compound which is present in bacteria, in prokaryotes, it's a hoponoid compound. So we see that there's a cyclic pore structure, uh, a side chain with some functional groups. So as this compound is buried further and deeper, and uh, uh, through diagenetic alterations, what happens is uh, these functional groups, which are more reactive, uh, so these functional groups are gone from the structure. Uh, and if there are uh, double bonds in the structure, which are again reactive sites, so double bonds will be hydrogenated. Whereas the core skeleton of the compound is preserved. And so with increasing uh, burial and diagenesis, uh, these four uh, compounds being preserved in the geosphere in the sediments, uh, these become uh, what we call the biomarkers. So these are basically uh, biopolymers uh, which have undergone uh, burial and diagenesis uh, in the geosphere in the sediments. So uh, coming to the Permian Triassic uh, study, so uh, uh, I mean this time window, uh, as I said, the late Permian, early Triassic. Time. During the late Permian, early Triassic time, 
India uh, was part of the uh, uh, this supercontinent uh, Pangaea, more specifically part of the Gondwana land, the southern uh, part of Pangaea, that is uh, the Gondwana land. So it was so India was uh, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so uh, and uh, <clears throat> so so my study is from uh, this present study is uh, from the Raniganj uh, subbasin part of the Damodar Koel. Uh, Gondwana Basin. So these Gondwana Basins, all these Gondwana Basins, they formed uh, early, uh, during early Permian time through rifting. And uh, so these uh, basins, they uh, comprise very thick uh, sedimentary uh, succession uh, since uh, early uh, early uh, Permian time. So so my present work is from this Rani Ganj uh, subbasin. <clears throat> now, so why uh, uh, why should we study this uh, PT boundary, PT extinction? Uh, I mean the PT uh, boundary, the Permian Triassic boundary. Uh, why is it uh, exciting or why is it interesting? So uh, so as I said, it is a mass extinction boundary, the, the severest one, uh, and quite a lot of studies uh, have been conducted. Uh, with PT uh, sediments on on PT sections to understand the mass extinction event. Uh, so uh, studies on carbon isotopes uh, uh, through uh, carbon isotope studies, uh, scientists have seen that uh, you know there's a sharp uh, negative excursion uh, of of uh, carbon isotopes, uh, which indicate that there was some environmental perturbations uh, during this time. Uh, and also on uh, vertebrates and uh, changing uh, river uh, morphology. And a lot of work also has been done uh, with marine, on marine sediments, uh, some of which have indicated, uh, you know, uh, occurrence of eugenia, that is, uh, you know, development of uh, hydrogen sulfide rich conditions in oceans uh, during the Permian, uh, the, the, uh, the end Permian time. Uh, but interestingly, not, uh, many studies have been focused on the floral dynamics, how the plants behaved during this time, uh, whether they suffered a lot uh, or how they uh, were affected uh, due to this event. So uh, that is something uh, which is not very well understood, uh, that how plants, how flora uh, responded uh, to this mass extinction event. So now, uh, since I have uh, a broad objective to study the flora uh, at the uh, during the uh, from through from late Permian through early Triassic, so now what are the very pointed questions that we can actually ask? So first of all, uh, the very uh, simple and uh, like easy questions, relatively easy questions to ask are, so what kind of flora uh, survived, uh, survived the uh, extinction event? Uh, while uh, what, what kind of flora, on the other hand, what kind of flora uh, diminished uh, or got exterminated? And uh, whether any novel kind of flora uh, originated post the extinction event during the early Triassic time? So this is a very straightforward question to ask. Similarly, uh, if we see, if we do see a floral turnover, a, a, a shift in the vegetation, so does it reflect anything about the environmental conditions? So we let's say we see some change. So what does the environment? What role does the environment? Uh, uh, what role did the environment play in this uh, in this turnover? So these are relatively simpler questions to ask, but the more complex questions are. Uh, the ones uh, which are highlighted here in red, that is, if we uh, see any environmental shift, if we see a floral shift, if we see a, an environmental shift, so what is it that has that had led to this environmental shift? Is it something local, some local phenomenon, some some regional pheno phenomenon, some some global process? You know, so uh, any kind of you know like large scale geological. Uh, process or phenomenon and uh, and what are the cascades so so if we if we are able to identify one such event or let's say a combination of such events 
So what are the cascading effects of those uh, events? So, so these are the questions, some of the questions at least, uh, some of the still broader questions that we can ask. <clears throat> so before we get into the details of the floral uh, dynamics, the floral changeover, let's uh, let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, the type of flora that uh, that existed in Pangaea during most of Permian and also during the late Permian uh, time. So so uh, in the Pangaea, uh, the 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 Angara fr uh, fragment in Pangaea. Uh, was mainly dominated uh, by the chordates. So chordates are uh, uh, gymnosperms and they are relatives of conifers. Whereas the Euramerican fragment was uh, mainly dominated by uh, a kind of pteridophyte that is lycopsid. So pteridophyte as in, in modern, on the modern planet, for example, ferns are pteridophytes. So, so the Euramerican uh, fragment was dominated uh, by the lycopsids. The Cathesia, uh, that is China, North and South China, uh, was dominated by gigantopteryx which is uh, a seed plant and believed to be uh, the ancestor of angiosperms, that is the flowering plants. While Gondwana, uh, which is, uh, you know, of, uh, I, I mean, my interest uh, right now, so uh, the Gondwana fragment was mainly, uh, all of Gondwana, all of it, uh, was dominated by the Glossopteryx, which is also, uh, uh, which was a seed plant, so it is an extinct uh, uh, ta uh, ta taxon now, uh, ex extinct taxon. So this Glossopteryx, uh, it was a, a very interesting kind of flora uh, called Pteridospermatophyta. So they are neither true pteridophytes nor true gymnosperms, uh, but have features and characteristics of both pteridophytes and uh, uh, and gymnosperms. And all of uh, each of these, they were the main pole forming biota uh, in Pangaea uh, during most of the, uh, the Permian time. So again, coming back uh, to the to the Gondwana Basin uh, study. So I had focused on the, the upper Permian Rani Ganj and the uh, lower Triassic uh, Panchet formation. So the Rani Ganj formation uh, comprised coal and sandstone and shale. Uh, whereas uh, pan in Panchet, that is uh, the low Triassic, uh, comprised uh, sandstone and shale while there were no uh, coal. Uh, so there was a marked uh, absence of coal in the Panchet formation. <clears throat> so uh, so I started with uh, you know outcrop sampling uh, in in Madhukunda region uh, in Raniganj Basin and uh, came across some interesting observations uh, like uh, you know uh, the very typical uh, permian uh, late permian fossils like glossopteris leaf and vertebraria root uh, in 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 raniganj formation uh, and uh, shale uh, in the panchet formation very highly weathered uh, shale in the panchet formation and the transition was actually is actually marked by a conglomerate mudstone lithotype the, the transition from permian to triassic and interestingly in the in the triassic beds in the triassic uh, panchet formation uh, we uh, came across uh, some interesting fossils perpetually of Lystrosaurus, uh, which is a kind of uh, mammon-like reptile. It's also it's, it's extinct uh, uh, organism now, but it, it's a sort of uh, mammon-like reptile. So I haven't studied yet these, but I wish to study these uh, perhaps in the in the in the in the future sometime. Uh, but however, I couldn't work uh, with these outcrop samples because they were highly weathered. So I went on to collect uh, core samples uh, for my study. So I uh, so so co uh, this uh, core uh, shales and uh, coals uh, I studied uh, for the organic geochemical analysis, uh, which were recovered uh, recovered by Coal India Limited. So once uh, we got the right kind of samples uh, for our study, uh, uh, so stepwise we have performed the. Uh, or, uh, the, the, the organic geochemical analysis. So once we have these uh, organic rich uh, core samples, uh, so we extracted the organic matter, which is uh, preserved in the sediments. So, so uh, 
so you extract the organic matter using organic solvents because we know the magazine that like dissolves like. So if you want to extract organic uh, matter, you need to use or, uh, something organic. So, so uh, we used a, a mixture of dichloromethane and methanol to extract uh, the organic matter from powdered sediments uh, in, a, in a speed extractor, extractor uh, and extraction equipment. And so once we have the total extract, it was fractionated into distinct fractions, the saturated hydrocarbon, the aromatic hydrocarbon, and the polar hydrocarbon. So, so uh, this was fractionated using silica gel uh, chromatography. Now, each of these fractions themselves, they are uh, complex mixtures of hundreds of compounds. So uh, they were further uh, analyzed in a GCMS. So in, if you run these samples in GC, these uh, aliquots in GC, so these mixtures are separated into individual compounds and you see those compounds in the form of peaks, something like this. So, <clears throat> so when I look into the data, uh, I found uh, a wide range of very interesting compounds, some of which uh, I will be presenting here. So, uh, uh, so when I looked into the normal alkane distribution, uh, these are straight chain, linear chain compounds, carbon hydrogen compounds. Uh, so when I looked into the normal alkane distribution, uh, I saw a very interesting distribution, uh, very interesting distribution, very distinct distribution uh, uh, in the sense that uh, in the, for the Permian samples, I saw that uh, the Permian samples are dominated by C23 and C25 alkanes, whereas the Triacic samples uh, are dominated by C27 and C29 uh, chain lengths. Uh, so why do we see uh, such a distinct uh, distribution of alkanes? <clears throat> Now these alkanes actually, uh, which largely, uh, which uh, which may come from the fatty acids in the cellular membrane structure. So, so organisms may directly produce normal alkanes or they may produce fatty acids, which may be diagenetically uh, altered to the normal alkanes. Now these normal alkanes, they actually uh, provide, uh, they actually uh, uh, protect the organisms uh, from desiccation. So they for, so these are like waxes. They are waxes. They are hydrophobic, so they don't. Uh, uh, so so uh, they don't allow water to evaporate out from the uh, you know the, the cells. So they protect the cells from desiccation. So now uh, organisms which thrive in aquatic system in in water columns or very close to water bodies. Those such organisms, they produce mid-chain alkanes like 21, 23, 25, or short-chain alkanes. You know, the microbes, they typically produce the short-chain alkanes. Whereas organisms which thrive in, in uh, uh, you know, in dry, drier condition, in arid condition or drier condition, they typically produce the longer chains. They typically produce 27, 29, 31, 33, 35, okay? So because, as I said, since they serve hydrophobic properties to organisms, the longer the chains, uh, the better the protection in arid or dry environment. So uh, this observation in uh, Permian uh, and Triassic sediments, it, it uh, prompts the question, as to uh, what we see here is whether it is uh, whether we see uh, do we see a shift in vegetation here? Can we can we uh, does it imply can we infer does it imply a shift in vegetation or a shift in the environmental condition? So uh, to answer that question <clears throat> further, uh, we also look into the uh, palynologic into the palynomorph distribution. So here, while a, a lot of uh, taxa are shown here, but I will particularly focus on these two uh, types of uh, uh, taxa, that is the glossopterids and the conifers. Okay, so if so, so this palino assemblage one is upper Permian, palino assemblage two is uh, lower Triassic, and we have a barren zone in between where we don't find uh, many, uh, where we don't, where we hardly find any uh, palinomorphs. So, so from this distribution, we see that uh, in the in the during the late Permian or in the upper Permian, we see uh, you know dominant presence of the glossopterids. 
uh, and some presence of conifers. Uh, but in the uh, in the Triassic, we see that the glossopterids almost dwindled, and while the conifers they survived and also diversified further. So if we uh, uh, if we try to infer uh, this data and we integrate this data with our alkane data, we can uh, we can posit we can uh, uh, give a conjecture that what we see here is a result of both a shift in vegetation and also shift in you know climate or environment environmental condition uh, because. The, uh, during the Permian, since we see a high, uh, a dominant presence of the glossopterids, so the glossopterids were, were uh, very likely producing the mid-chain alkanes. And also, interestingly, glossopterids are known uh, to be thriving. They they thrived in uh, they thrived close to water bodies. They they were not aquatic plants. They were growing on land, but they uh, grew close to water bodies, such that their roots uh, were in close association. Uh, with the waters, so so such kind of flora would typically produce uh, the mid-chain alkenes because, as I said, the aquatic plants, uh, plants growing in aquatic system, aquatic, in, you know, in water columns or very close to water columns, they are known to produce uh, the mid-chain alkenes. Whereas the conifers, which are known to grow in slightly, uh, you know, slightly uh, arid condition and in highlands, so uh, they would. Be producing uh, the the uh, the longer chain alkenes that is 27, uh, 29, and thirty one. Uh, so so yeah. So this is one observation that we see uh, a, a shift in the vegetation with uh, I mean concomitantly with shift in the environmental condition. So that is one thing. Now, uh, so the other compounds uh, that uh, uh, I had detected, uh, that I had uh, identified in the sediments are diterpenoids, uh, steroids, hopenoids, and carotenoids. But due to limited time, I'm not uh, you know, going into the details of these uh, compounds yet. But uh, these are uh, the very cyclic compounds that were detected. But a very interesting uh, uh, set of compounds that were detected in the sediments were the uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. These are aromatic compounds and polyaromatic, uh, so they have multiple benzene rings. So these are very condensed uh, structures. So uh, a wide variety of different types of, uh, you know, uh, these polyaromatic hydrocarbons were detected in the in the sediments, um, both uh, in the in the uh, Permian sediments and uh, in, the, in the transition sediments and also in the Triassic sediments, but uh, these polyaromatic hydrocarbons were dominantly present in the uh, in the uh, Permian sediments. Uh, also, uh, in addition to the uh, to the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, we also identified uh, presence of micro charcoal uh, in the sediments. Again. Uh, across the section. Uh, so these ch uh, charcoal, they were identified as trachyte. So these trachyte, uh, they are burnt uh, remains. Uh, they are incinerated remains of, uh, you know, these the, the, the vascular tissues, that is xylem and phloem, which are conducting tissues in plants. The xylem uh, conducts water, the phloem, uh, it distributes the nutrition across the plants. So these conducting tissues, which are made up, actually, these are made up of lignin. That's the reason they have, it's a biopolymer. It's a very, very robust biopolymer. So they have very high preservation potential as well. So these uh, lignified, uh, burnt, uh, incinerated uh, lignified trachyte were seen uh, in the sediments. So uh, very similar. So these these uh, molecular uh, remains, the molecular uh, incinerated residue and the morphological incinerated incinerated residue, they uh, the distribution are very very similar in the sense that. Uh, both were uh, found to be dominant. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the abundance was uh, very high and dominant in the upper Permian sediments, uh, while it slowly it decreased across the section. Uh, so from this, uh, we uh, we posited, uh, we again uh, uh, come up with a conjecture that uh, during the upper Permian time, uh, there were uh, massive incidents of forest fires 
wildfires because these polyaromatic hydrocarbons, particularly the more condensed ones, they are known to form at very high temperatures. So the, the, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons actually they may form from any of these cyclic compounds or even uh, these uh, even uh, by the cyclization and aromatization of the alkanes uh, at uh, 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 with increasing temperature at high temperatures uh, and we also see actual morphological remains of burnt plant parts. Uh, so so uh, we conjecture that during the Upper Permian time, uh, there were a massive uh, uh, incidents of wildfires. The, uh, the wildfires, they continued uh, across the transition and during the early Triassic, but uh, from the abundance, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we suggest, uh, with, I mean, the decreasing abundance of the uh, pH and the charcoal, micro charcoal, we suggest that it is probably uh, the, the frequency was slowly, the fires were slowly, uh, you know, like subsiding. So not only in uh, this particular study, so when I looked up in literature, I was curious when I found out that uh, when we found signatures of the wildfire events, I was curious to see if wildfires were actually prevalent across Pangaea. So I looked up literature and I did find uh, several literature from across Pangaea, from various parts in Pangaea, uh, reporting evidences of wildfires, which uh, suggests that uh, this wildfire, the forest, uh, this forest fire, uh, forest fires were uh, prevalent. Uh, uh, you know, during the late Permian time uh, across Pangaea. So <clears throat> now if we uh, put everything together, uh, what can we uh, say as concluding remarks, some of the concluding remarks that, uh, some of the things that we can infer. So we see three distinct uh, paleoecology. Uh, we see very distinct paleoecology uh, across the Upper Permian uh, Lower Triassic section. So in the Upper Permian, we see uh, a, a floodplain environment, which is forested, which uh, which has which had a dense forest of uh, uh, of glossopterids, mainly glossopterids and some conifers. Uh, and the glossopterids being the main pole forming biota during the, uh, during in fact, most of the Permian and also, <clears throat> also during late Permian. Uh, and there were massive incidents of uh, uh, wildfires. So during the transition, uh, we actually see from the data, we see that it is largely, it was a barren landscape. Uh, I mean, the forest was largely gone. Uh, uh, with just some uh, some residue uh, and most, uh, but there are there, there are evidences of uh, charcoal uh, presence of charcoal and pH. Uh, so that probably indicates that uh, by and large the forest was gone, but there may have been some dieback vegetation. You know the the healthy forest. Uh, the main coal forming forest was gone, but uh, maybe there was some presence of. Uh, dieback uh, vegetation, which were burning and producing the incinerated uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and the micro charcoal. Uh, and, uh, but in the, in the uh, upper, uh, in the, during the early Triassic, we see that uh, the vegetation uh, was slowly uh, being restored in the floodplain environment, but now the vegetation type has changed. So instead, so there were some gloss still Still surviving, still remaining, but uh, most of the uh, floodplain environment was now being populated by the conifers. Uh, but, however, interestingly, the density of uh, the vegetation was uh, not very uh, large, uh, and hence we do not find any coal. So, it didn't. The, the density of vegetation did not attend the the late Permian. Uh, as it was during the late Permian time. Uh, so while uh, the vegetation was being slowly restored, but it was being uh, populated by other sort of biota like the conifers and the lycopsids, which are also known as, uh, which are also kind of uh, opportunistic biota. They are usually uh, found in slightly stressed environment and usually found uh, across extinction boundaries. So this is, uh, so, so we see a disparate fate of the Gondwana flora. While the glossopteris could not survive, uh, the conifers started to become dominant. This is one observation that we see. Now, if we try to explain this uh, observation, uh, uh, 
So uh, do we do we uh, have a, a very uh, sort of pertinent explanation as to how why this happened? I mean, uh, this uh, vegetation shift occurred. Uh, so uh, I looked up uh, in literature. Uh, to try and explain, you know, this vegetation shift. And interestingly, I came across uh, literature uh, which says that conifers are actually, in, very interestingly, they have a very, uh, uh, a very uh, deep association with fires. So conifers, which evolved uh, way back in time, around 300, 350 million years ago, about 350 million years ago. So the conifers, they actually originated in a fire-prone environment. Even during that time, during Carboniferous time, fires were uh, quite prevalent because of the huge forests, the oxygen concentration was high, higher. So, so uh, you know, even during those times, massive fires, there were outbreaks of massive uh, forest fires. So the conifers actually originated in fire-prone environment. So it is possible that what we see here, the, the survival and uh, diversification of the conifers across these extinction boundary uh, where uh, fires were prevalent during the late Permian time. So this may be a result of the association of conifers or rather the adaptation of conifers. The conifers were already pre-adapted to fire-prone environment. So it is possible that the conifers could survive, not just survive, but they also diversified. Uh, uh, during early Triassic time. So this may have a relation uh, with uh, the, the fires. But however, the glossopterids, uh, they were, uh, they could not cope up uh, in fire prone environments, although they were uh, the dominant biota throughout Permian, but they probably could not survive uh, consistent uh, recurrent fire episodes. So, uh, so probably that is one reason which they uh, why they died out, and also the shift in vegetation because since they were known to grow and thrive in humid environment, so um, the early Triassic time may have been an arid uh, may have uh, it may have been. Uh, may have become arid. So the, the, the humid uh, adapted uh, glossopterids could not survive in the arid environment. So now, uh, not only for conifers, interestingly for even the flowering plants, that is the angiosperms, uh, we have seen, I mean, uh, there are uh, there are studies which have suggested that the, that the spread, uh, the diversification, the radiation of angiosperms, <clears throat> during Cretaceous are also uh, uh, linked with fires. So what uh, what is the what is one possible takeaway message from this? Uh, so we see that any environmental um, parameter or some some phenomenon in the environment, for example, fires, wildfires, forest fires. Now we see we uh, now fires may may not always. Uh, be uh, you know have a negative effect or uh, only have detrimental effects on organisms. In fact, what we see here uh, is uh, a possible demonstration of the fact that uh, some organisms may actually benefit from fires, like the conifers did across uh, uh, during uh, across the uh, this uh, PT uh, you know this uh, during early Triassic in a fire prone environment or the flowering plants uh, have during the Cretaceous. So uh, uh, so I think this could be uh, one possible take home message from this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that brings to uh, the end of uh, my talk and I shared some insights uh, of the floral dynamics, floral shift during the late Permian early Triassic time. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Olina. Uh, question. Yes. Did you hear it? I no, is there a question? I, I couldn't hear. Okay. He's coming. 
near the okay. microphone. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you for a detailed talk. I just had, you mentioned about wildfires uh, in your talk, and you yeah. mentioned about um, uh, whether what was burning, you mentioned it was barren land. Uh, but you got this uh, insight using charcoal, so pelinological data sets. But just by using pH, can you distinguish what was getting burned, like C3 plants or C4 plants, based on their molecular weight? or different pH, can you distinguish those? No, can you please repeat? I, I couldn't hear okay. properly. Please be a little louder and uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, I just, the simple question is using pH, yeah. can you distinguish what mm -hmm. was getting burned? C3 okay, okay. Yeah, I, just I using it. pH. Okay, okay, yeah. So using pH, no, you cannot, the answer is no. I mean, you cannot distinguish uh, what kind of plants, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, organic material uh, was burning. You cannot uh, distinguish because uh, this pH uh, formation, it follows a chain of reactions. Okay, with uh, increasing temperatures, you get more and more condensed structures uh, with higher number of uh, benzene rings uh, in the structure. So just by using pH, just by looking at pH, you cannot really say uh, what kind of organic material was burning. For that, you have to uh, look into the, the morphological remains, you know. So from, but from the pH, you can definitely say that there have been uh, some high temperature uh, process. Some high temperature process has uh, occurred depending on the type of pH that you see. That is also important because uh, in fact uh, when uh, organic material uh, they uh, go into the catagenetic window from the diagen uh, from diagenetic to diagenesis to catagenesis and in, into the catagenetic window uh, even catagenesis also forms pH okay with the gradual increase in temperature in the geosphere. Uh, so uh, but if you have uh, the more condensed structures, you can say that there have been uh, some uh, uh, extreme high temperature events like a volcanic eruption, let's say, or uh, forest fires. Uh, that you can interpret uh, or you can infer. But what kind of organic material was burning, what kind of plant uh, was burning, whether it is C3, C4, uh, those uh, you cannot really distinguish. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question. Sure. Yeah. What is the question? I couldn't hear. The first question was how this biomarker proxy survives through the tectonic forcing and warming, high temperature and high metamorphism, low or high metamorphism. And the second question is Second question is clear? No, no, I couldn't hear. Do you hear the first question? I heard it from you. So, uh, yeah, I can answer uh, this first and then go on to the next question. So the question was, uh, if I heard uh, correctly, uh, is how 
these biomarkers, uh, whether they survive tectonic events or uh, metamorphic metamorphism, is that the yeah. question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So they actually the answer is they do not really survive. Okay. So in highly uh, you know in regions um, uh, of active tectonism, uh, there is a uh, very little chance of uh, preservation of organic matter particularly if high temperatures are involved and uh, so so the uh, you know the bio uh, these biomarkers these organic compounds are recognizable in sediments uh, which have undergone diagenetic alteration and catagenetic alteration but if you go into the metagenesis stage uh, or at the metamorphic stage it becomes all graphitic so this these polyaromatic hydrocarbons with increasing temperatures with increasing depth these uh, the organic compounds they lose their distinct structures and they become aromatic hydrocarbons typically the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and these polyaromatic hydrocarbons with further burial and with further increase in temperature, they just become graphite. They just become dead carbon. So you cannot really uh, recognize uh, the, uh, the the organic compounds uh, in at metagenetic stage or they don't survive metamorphism. They are not recognizable in metamorphic rocks. Okay, thank you. And now in the chat, I put another question. You see the chat? Uh, no, the chat, okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah, okay, so what is the role of, so the question is, what is the role of the Siberian traps and volcanism uh, in causing wildfires? Okay, so uh, yeah, that's a very good question actually, because the Siberian traps incidentally, uh, they occurred uh, during the very time, uh, it's kind of concurrent, uh, you know, it's concurrent with the mass extinction event. So the obvious question to ask is whether the Siberian traps, uh, they do have, the, the occurrence has a, a, a relation, a connection with the mass extinction. Now, if we see, uh, if we go to, let's say, if we go to this image, okay, so uh, the Siberian traps, uh, this volcanism uh, occurred uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but yeah, uh, very likely it had uh, a, a very uh, long range, I mean, geographically wide, rather, uh, you know, geographically wide uh, range of effects. Uh, because the, the Siberian traps, uh, you know, it must have um, uh, caused uh, an increase in, in the temperatures, okay, because uh, this, this volcanic event, you know, it vented out uh, carbon dioxide and, uh, you know, sulfur gases, uh, so might have increased uh, the temperatures, mm, uh, which, uh, just a moment, is there a follow-up question? So, so the increase in temperature, uh, so the increase in temperature uh, may have uh, sort of uh, kind of triggered uh, wildfires. It is one possibility. And uh, I, I see another part of the question. Uh, modern, uh, okay, so in a modern lake setting, want to distinguish natural versus anthropogenic fire? Can you do that? Um, As, uh, actually, uh, directly, it is, again, difficult. I mean, because the polyaromatic hydrocarbons are simply these aromatic uh, compounds which do not have uh, recognizable structures. Because, for example, if we see other compounds, which I actually, due to limited time, I could not show, you know, the various diterpenoids or steroids or carotenoids or hopenoids, they have very distinct structures. And uh, these kind of compounds, which are produced from isoprene units, the basic fundamental unit of biomarkers. So uh, these isoprene units, they cyclize to form the different terpenoids and they have very, very specific structures. Uh, these, and these are natural organic compounds. If you see man-made compounds, uh, anthropogenic compounds, like for example, thalates. So thalates, these are uh, esters, uh, which are found in plastics. And they are man-made, so they have. So these are also polymers, uh, but they have 
very different sort of structures, very distinct structures, very different from organic compounds. But uh, when it uh, when a compound uh, transforms into aromatic hydrocarbons, into uh, into these polyaromatic uh, uh, hydrocarbons, they lose the specificity uh, of the uh, you know the, the the specific structures, the specific characteristics uh, are gone. So uh, as such, it is uh, difficult. But but one thing that we can uh, say is, uh, so I'm going back to the question. So anthropogenic, uh, OK, anthropogenic fire, you mean natural versus anthropogenic fire. So no, we exactly can't really distinguish whether it, the, a fire was started or uh, you know it, it was a natural wildfire. In fact, uh, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons may even come from petroleum, uh, from fuels by burning fuels, uh, you know, so so we can't really distinguish between uh, the natural and anthropogenic pH in sediments. Only thing we can say is, uh, if it is modern sediment, surface sediment, they are not catagenetic hydrocarbons. This much we can say. Uh, it may come from fuel, or it may come even through cooking, uh, uh, or, you know, fires, natural or anthropogenic. Uh, but no, we can't as such distinguish. Okay, thank you very much, Amila. We are over the time. Yeah. So really, thank you very much, and I hope that you will be able to visit us. Yeah. Okay. Afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very nice experience for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye.